This update is going to make you regret deleting all those registered files. Welcome to SETI Astro. Now, if you don't have the latest version of SETI Astro Suite, be sure to go to SETIAstro.com under Astro Program SETI Astro Suite. It's now version 2.11. Along with what I'm going to highlight today, the SETI Astro Suite now uses multi cores on multi core CPUs during computationally expensive operations uh, involving, you know, like all the pixels in the images. So, statistical stretch, curves, things like that will now utilize all the cores for your CPU to greatly speed up the process. A couple other quick updates for 2.11. Under file, you'll see a new project. What that'll do is delete everything in your slots and masks and everything and, and bring you back to a, a clean slate. So that way uh, you don't have to like close and reopen SETI Astro Suite to get you in that state because on Macs for Mac OS 15, for whatever reason, if you're not a certified developer, it it takes a couple minutes to open. So now you can just go ahead and, and make a new project. There's also a little about me there that you can go to my website and it does have the, the latest version listed there as well. Mosaic is no longer called Mosaic, it's just star stuff. You know, we have stellar alignment, plate solve, PSF, and now we have our new supernova asteroid hunter. You could also find it up in the, the toolbars here too. Now what this is going to do is allow you to define a reference image. So stacking programs, when it's generating the images to stack, it has to align them all first, effectively creating registered images. And then with those registered images, that's how it, then I'll use those for the stack. Deep Sky Stacker, Pix Insight, you know, all those have the option to save your registered images as well. Most people just delete the registered images when they're done. It takes up a lot of memory. You may not even save them to begin with. Uh, but, but with this, you may want to keep them just for a little bit. Because what we'll do is select a reference image. And then all the search images we want. It's going to normalize everything. So very similar to stacking but instead of stacking everything together it's going to look for differences between the reference image and the various search images and it's going to ignore things like single pixel blemishes like cosmic ray blemishes uh, it's going to ignore really big things like satellite streaks it's really looking for those stellar like features that aren't in the reference image so if you had a multi-night session uh, with, I don't know, a galaxy, or you took galaxy images one season to the next, you could, you could utilize this to look for um, brightening of any nova or supernova within those galaxies. The other thing it's really good at is detecting asteroids. So it's going to look, you know, in those various search images and, and find those star-like things that are slowly drifting or moving within your images uh, to, to pin down, you know, the, the different asteroids that are in there. So let's jump right into it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and select a reference image. I have a set of images where I, I know that there's an asteroid in some of them here, but I'm going to set my reference image. I'm going to click select search images. Now you can select as many or as few as you want. Um, it, it does take a bit of time. I don't need any cosmetic correction. This is if you have really bad single pixel kind of issues. You shouldn't have to run that since we're excluding single pixel defects or anomalies, uh, but you may want to run that. And then the anomaly detection threshold. This is how bright the object is in that subtractive image. So when it takes the search image minus the reference image, Theoretically, if nothing changed between those images, that whole image should essentially be black. But if there is something different between the two, this is that threshold. So 0.1 is a fairly um, low amount. Maybe you just want to see brighter anomalies from image to image. It just depends on what you're imaging and uh, what your threshold you want. 
And then all you gotta do is click uh, process. So it has to do a number of different things. For color images, it has to neutralize the background. Grayscale, it, it doesn't have to, but it needs to perform a basic gradient removal on all the images and then normalize them all to the exact same brightness such that when we do the subtraction, it doesn't detect a gradient as an anomaly or just one image being brighter than the other as an anomaly. So it's gonna go through and um, do that for all the images. Now that it can utilize multiple cores, the stretching and stuff in the background does happen much more rapidly. So it's still a, a bit of a process, but it does move along much faster than it would have if I hadn't uh, figured out how to enable multi-core threading. After it does all the pre-processing, you'll see it go into the processing stage where it's actually doing the uh, subtraction and anomaly recognition. All right, when it's done running, it's going to open two little windows here. The first one is the actual results. It'll show you, you know, here's, here's all the image files. Here's the anomalies that found in them. Uh, you know, some of them are zeros. This one says four. And then uh, there's a, a detailed results analysis where not only will it tell you the one or the two or the zero of them, but where in the image it actually is. But, you know, that's, that's useful if you want to like copy and paste into some kind of a record. But the anomaly results page here, you can double click any of these and it's gonna go ahead and pull up a window of your image and it's going to box the anomaly for you. So you can you know, fit it to preview or zoom in and see exactly what that anomaly is. And here, I'll just open two of them. Here's the anomaly again. And if you look carefully uh, from the anomaly to this star here, you can see that it's it's moving along and it is a little streaky. It's not quite uh, stellar like. So this is this is really something in the image that's that's moving through the image. We could also look at this one that says four. And this is interesting too. This this found multiple things in here that are showing me that the mount was bumped. Uh, right? You can see that the stars have these little streaks. And it must be because the, the mount was bumped in, in the middle of the night or something. So I guess in, in a roundabout way, that, that, that was useful information too. You, you may not want to keep that sub at all. Uh, and that may not have been something you would have even seen uh, doing a blink. That, that there are those streaks and this, this was actually, actually a bad frame. But let's, let's go back to these ones that it's definitely something in there and it's definitely moving. So... This spans from 33 down to 43. We might as well, we can keep this open as long as we want. You don't need to close that. I'll close down the Supernova Asteroid Hunter. And I'm going to pull up Blink. And it was the 33 through 43, I believe. Now I'm just uh, cycling through Blink here. And you can see our little, our little object there just, just moving along. All right, also using uh, the plate solver, I was able to get the, you know, the exact RA and deck we need uh, for the image that, that had that stuff. And it also has, you know, the, the date and time we did the, the observation. So this is all going to be important to actually try to figure out what that, what that thing was, right? The next thing we need to do is, is figure out what, what that thing was. So I use Stellarium a lot of the time. I know a lot of people have Stellarium. You may use other planetary uh, software to try to figure out what the asteroid was. You could even do this in PixInsight, but I know a lot of you, if you're using SETI Astro Suite, you probably don't have, don't have PixInsight. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is go to the configuration window under plugins, solar system editor, configure, and then under the solar system tab, click import orbital elements and then you can download it from a list from the internet. You could do asteroids or comets. And the MPCAT, this is this is all the asteroids that are that are cataloged. So lots of them. 
you got to kind of download them one at a time. The more of them you download, the longer it takes Delirium to uh, open at startup because it needs to uh, calculate the orbits from the orbital elements for all those different things uh, since it is a planetarium software. So just a just little, little word there. And then the next thing to do is let's go ahead and go to the, the date and time from that observation. So in my case, it was last year. It was in April on the 22nd. And the time was 21, 37, close enough. And I must start observing that as, as soon as I could. It's it's almost on the horizon, so I, I am gonna tick us up here in an hour or two. It was in the extreme southern end of my view. And here's uh, the planetary nebula I was uh, capturing at the time. And look at this little guy right here, right, right off the bat. 584 Semiramis type asteroid and overlaying my sensor on it. Yeah, it, that's that's where it was in my image, right? It was right there in the very top of it, uh, kind of off center to the to the left. And again, we can we can pull up one of these and check it out. And there it was on the actual sensor, and you could see just the faint outline of the planetary nebula there. And there's our little asteroid up in the upper left, just where it is in uh, in Solarium. So now that we know what our little object is 584 semiramis you know stellarium does have a a ton of detail off to the side there is a great website uh it's 3d asteroids.space i'll have a, a link in the description as well but you could you could look up these asteroids and and here it is the the little one that was in my image 584 semiramis again it has the orbital characteristics there you can put on like the apparent color it's it's quite dark uh, which is not uncommon for these kind of asteroids. You can put a grid on it. Uh, you can just have it rotate and stuff. It's, it's just a cool little thing. It has some other links there to uh, like the Minor Planet Center, JPL Small, Bo Small Body Database. Uh, just just some cool things. And again, it's one of those things. Is it going to help you make a pretty picture? Not at all. Uh, it, it's just something I... I mean, I, I love doing this kind of stuff, seeing what's in your image, checking those little things out. And in order for it to, to work properly, all the images need to be registered to each other. So you could either uh, star align them all to the exact same reference image or just use the registered images uh, from your stacking program. So if, uh, if unfortunately you've deleted all the temporary registered files, you may want to go back through and just rerun it up to that point uh, so you have them and then you could run them through the the supernova asteroid hunter i have found other anomalies too uh there was a a, a weird pattern that didn't look like any uh satellite or anything i've ever seen it, it was a satellite it was rotating causing some some flashes uh and it, it's just just those little little things of discovery. Who, who know, knows what you're going to find? You, you may end up finding a nova as it's happening, right? When you're looking at uh, stars, star clusters, things like that. The initial reference image from one night may not have a brighter than normal star. And then, you know, within a few hours of imaging or the next night when you're imaging, that star has flared up and is much brighter than it was before. That's going to show up as an anomaly in this a supernova asteroid hunter so a lot of cool things uh, you can do with this if you're into doing uh, sky surveys looking for asteroids looking for comets uh, things like that it's not everybody's cup of tea but uh, it's it's again going back to the, that sense of exploration that we're actually doing with our our telescopes you know a uh, hundred years ago people would have no idea what we're able to capture in our own backyards with uh, amateur amateur equipment. 
So just a, another uh, cool little thing here for Steady Astro Suite. The big thing that behind the scenes is for sure uh, the ability to use multiple cores on your CPU now uh, and just a, just a ton of bug fixes as well. Uh, but I'm excited to see where this is going. Uh, let me know if uh, we need to add some kind of a registration or batch stellar alignment so we can um, utilize the, the Supernova Asteroid Hunter if uh, people have deleted all their, their registered images. Please comment, like, and subscribe.